Thank you all for joining uh, this, this very interesting seminar. My name is Bert Hoffman. I am the director of the East Asian Institute. And we're delighted to have Professor Andrew Walder here today to talk about a, a historical topic, but a very interesting and, and frankly, a, a very violent part of China's history and, and fairly recent history during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and, and really he's focusing on the uh, the regional civil war, as he calls it, in, in Guangxi, the fight between the Red Guards of the various factions of the Red Guards that turned very violent, particularly in Guangxi province. Uh, Professor Andrew Walder is the Denise O'Leary and Kent Theory Professor in the Department of Sociology uh, at the University of uh, at Stanford University, and he is also the um, senior fellow in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Study. Uh, Professor Walder has studied the, the Cultural Revolution quite extensively, and amongst his publications are the Agents of This Order Inside China's Cultural Revolution, and A Decade of Upheaval, The Cultural Revolution in Rural China. And this talk is based on his most recent book uh, from March 2023, Civil War in Guangxi, The Cultural Revolution in China's Southern Periphery. Andrew, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bert, very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Jiwei, thanks for thinking of this. Um, uh, let me share my screen. I, I do have slides um, and uh, kick it off. I assume you can see this. Um, so uh, uh, this topic is one that's uh, intrigued and fascinated me for, for decades. Um, uh, Guangxi in 1967 and 1968 uh, has long had a reputation as the most violent region in the early phase of the Cultural Revolution, 1967-68. There were, there were published reports in the 1990s by authors like Zheng Yi and Donald Sutton uh, that were based on leaks from internal party investigations from the 1980s that described gruesome massacres of non-combatants in villages, uh, the eradication of entire households, sexual violence, and even cannibalism. That was the cannibalism was the most spectacular of, of the descriptions that were that dominated those accounts. And there were unusually high casualty counts, although we didn't know exactly um, um, what, what the death rates were. And these reports found their way into published local annals uh, in the 19, end of the 1990s and into the 2000s, and they included gruesome details of village massacres. Um, in the internal investigation reports, which are now widely available, they're, they're available um, uh, in, uh, as PDFs um, uh, online. Uh, I have uh, most of the original reports that I've procured in various ways in China and outside China. Uh, they in, the, the, the internal investigation reports indicate that a, mil, a minimum of around 100,000 people were killed in Guangxi, in, 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 mostly in the summer of 1968. And this implies a death rate of four per thousand, which is roughly double my estimate for China as a whole, for the rest of China during that phase of the Cultural Revolution. And so the, the question, uh, there really is no, there's really no point to continue to describe the gruesome violence as been described many, many times in, in uh, publications in English and in Chinese. But the question is, why was Guangxi so much more violent? This kind of thing didn't happen in very many regions in China. Um, the only the only thing that was uh, similar was uh, a county in in uh, far southern Hunan called Dao County, Daoxian, which actually borders on Guangxi. Uh, but why was Guangxi so different? Um, and there are two types of explanations. Um, first, about the nature of the political conflicts in in the province, um, and um, second, about the distinctive features of Guangxi uh, and. So um, the first, uh, let me, let me, I don't know if you can see this, but I want, yeah, there you go, that clears that up. Um, one portrayal, uh, probably, probably the dominant portrayal of, of political conflicts in Guangxi and in China during this phase of the Cultural Revolution was that the conflict between the Allied Command faction and the April 22nd faction, 
was a certain kind of class struggle. Um, this is uh, has been applied to Guangxi in publications by Hua Linshan, who was from uh, Guilin uh, and later left China and wrote reports, uh, wrote uh, articles about um, about Guangxi and the Cultural Revolution. He got his PhD, I believe, in Paris. Uh, Yang Jisheng uh, has written about this as well. His recent book about the Cultural Revolution in China employs this kind of analysis for what the politics were like there in Guangxi. And in this portrayal, the Allied Command faction represents what Yang Jisheng calls a bureaucratic clique that were defending their power and privilege, and they were made up of military officers, ranking officials, party members who had a stake in the status quo. Uh, and in this portrayal, the April 22nd faction were considered rebels or radicals, and they were anti-establishment insurgents. And the overwhelming violence applied uh, at the end of this phase of the Cultural Revolution by the Allied Command uh, after Beijing's July 3rd orders called for ruthless suppression uh, illustrated, according to this point of view, uh, the lengths to which the privileged people uh, in China's political system would go to defend their power against insurgents. So it, it's really portrayed as a kind of class struggle, and this is a very common interpretation of factional violence uh, in China during that period. Uh, the second uh, and much more intriguing and much more recent um, interpretation of the politics uh, is that it was a form of in, uh, intergroup, genocidal intergroup violence. Uh, and this is uh, this has basically been uh, offered in an award-winning book by my former uh, Stanford PhD student advisee, uh, Yang Su, who teaches at UC Irvine. Uh, and in this remarkable book, he argues that the factional struggle of the kind described just before on the previous slide is really largely relevant to the generation of the high death rates. Uh, this is really quite, uh, quite a, a novel interpretation. And uh, Yang argued that almost all the deaths occurred in rural regions where factional conflicts were absent. Okay. Uh, he, he, his estimate based on uh, published county annals uh, is that only 15% of the deaths in Guangxi were from factional battles and almost all of it was in cities uh, and county seats. The victims in the villages, the remaining 85%, he argued, were members of households stigmatized as bad elements by the regime. Uh, the killers, he argued, were ordinary men. This is um, a, a line he borrowed from, I believe, uh, uh, an academic study of the Rwanda massacres in the 1990s. These people, he argued, were residents of the same villages. They were not agents of the state under orders from above. Um, and the reason why ordinary villagers uh, turned on people who, who were categorized as bad class background, former landlords, former, uh, former capitalists, former members of the nationalists, and so forth, uh, they were framed, those groups were framed uh, as part of an anti-communist conspiracy uh, by class enemies, and they launched unintended attacks on stigmatized households. In other, in other words, these were not ordered by the military authorities, but when the military authorities uh, threw this rhetoric out there, they stimulated uh, latent antagonisms of ordinary households towards these former class enemies uh, of the regime. Um, and uh, Yang drew parallels with genocidal group violence uh, in Rwanda, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, and partition era India. Now, this is a very uh, novel uh, sociological account um, uh, based on theories about intergroup antagonism. Okay, so it's a very different picture of, of what happened. Um, and the second category of explanations is that there's something different about Guangxi from other parts of China. Uh, of course, uh, during that period, Guangxi was very backward economically. It had very low levels of urbanization and education. It was overwhelmingly agricultural and rural. And reports of the gruesome massacres and especially reports of cannibalism suggested to many uh, of the popular writers 
uh, in China who dis disc uh, discussed this period. Uh, it, it suggested that the, the killings were uh, um, the result of cultural backwardness and that this cultural backward backwardness was an important cause of the killings. Uh, another distinctive feature is the remoteness of rural communities. Uh, of those I know many of you have been to Guangxi, it's well known for the beauty of its mountainous terrain, but that mountainous terrain uh, means that many rural regions are poorly accessible during this period. And Su Yang, Yang Su points this out uh, as a, a feature of Guangxi's topography that permitted these local killings to spin out of control of the authorities. That things, because so many of these villages were remote, the killings became much more severe and the authorities were unable to stop them in these remote areas. Um, and he points out, and I think this is correct, that the authorities never directly mandated this kind of massacres, and they certainly didn't mandate or suggest cannibalism as something that should be carried out. Uh, and he points out they tried unsuccessfully to halt them when they were underway. So remoteness uh, is one feature of Guangxi that Yang thought was important. Uh, of course, ethnic composition is the first thing you probably think of. Um, uh, uh, Guangxi's population, about um, 30 percent, what was it now, were, were um, uh, Zhuang. Um, there were um, uh, also a, a smattering of, of Yao and Miao. Uh, the Zhuang are China's largest ethnic minority. We usually think of Tibetans and Uyghurs uh, or Mongols, but there are many more Zhuang than there are these people, other, other people, and almost all of them are in Guangxi. So one question is, was violence uh, intensified by ethnic antagonism in uh, uh, regions that had mixed populations? That, that seems a reasonable argument. Uh, Yang Su argued that that was not the case, uh, but the, that the element in Guangxi's population that really made it violent was the presence of Hakka, who were late Han migrants into the South with a distinctive dialect and culture. Um, uh, Yang argued and just pointed out the fact that, that um, the, um, the Hakka had a history of blood feuds with earlier Han settlers over land and water rights. The Hakka Bundi Wars uh, in neighboring Guangdong in the 19th century uh, have been estimated to kill around a million people uh, during the early 19th century. Um, and Yang posits a Hakka tradition of militant self-defense that was activated by the conflicts of the period. And Yang does not feel embarrassed about making these claims about Hakka culture because he himself is Hakka and he comes from the Hakka heartland uh, of, of Guangdong. Uh, now, um, sources. Uh, the prior research, um, almost all of my research prior to this book, and uh, uh, Su Yang's, Yang Su's uh, research also is based primarily on published local annals, which can be highly revealing. Uh, and they provided a great deal more statistical detail about this period and these kinds of events than the uh, published annals in other, other regions of China. But they also uh, described in, in remarkably gruesome detail some of these killings, and they obviously were drawing on these uh, internal investigation reports that I'm using for this book. Uh, my studies based on the entire set of the internal investigations from the early 80s, which were ordered by the CCP Central Committee when Hu Yaobang was the General Secretary. Uh, they include detailed chronologies of events in each of the 80 counties and six cities in Guangxi, uh, and also detailed chronologies for each of the provincial government and party departments and agencies. There's abundant narrative and statistical detail at each level, including the identities of victims and of the perpetrators. Uh, and the published annals, just to give you a sense of how much more detailed these are than the published uh, annals, um, the, the data set that Young and I worked on together um, we, we um, had descriptions of around 450 political events in Guangxi during this two-year period in our data set. The investigation reports have more than 10 times as many political events that they describe. So these are much more detailed than the relatively detailed uh, and revealing materials that Yang and I both used uh, in our previous work. 
Uh, this is a picture of what these materials look like. Uh, they're published as paperback books. There are 18 volumes. They range from around 200 pages to around 550 pages each. Um, they are in, encased in these nice uh, blue plastic covers, uh, which, which unfortunately cracked after a great deal of use over the years. Um, uh, so one problem that I, I faced, the first time I've ever really faced this problem, is I had too much information, too much, too much evidence to process. Um, and so I, I had the strategy, a twofold strategy. First, uh, I coded a bunch of summary overviews of political narratives across six cities and 80 counties to try to reconstruct the sequences of the formation of factions and the progress of the political conflict over time. So the book has a lot of, a lot of narrative of the political events of the period. Uh, Yang's book has nothing about the politics of the period. It's, it's sociology all the way down. Uh, and I think that's one of the major differences uh, in the story that I'm telling. Um, and, you know, I can't, I can't blame him for focusing on the sociological aspects of this. But for me, I, I think understanding the way the politics unfolded is really key. Um, the second strategy is to extract data about the timing and features of more than these more than 4,500 political events and the related death counts encode them into a database so that we can do some relatively uh, straightforward statistical analysis that tests different ideas about where and when were the death rates uh, most extreme. Uh, and link these events together with data about the cities and counties where the events occurred. So we, we, we've been able, or I've been able to, with my RAs, to um, compile data on minority or Hakka populations in each county, level of urbanization, number of party members, number of state cadres, distance from political centers, remoteness, and so forth. So uh, this is the result. Um, this has been out, I guess, for, for about a month. Um, I, I, Bert says it's going to sell a lot. I, I, I'm not too confident. Maybe, maybe well into the, uh, the four figures. I don't know if I'm lucky. Um, the main findings, let me just run through the main findings before I get in, uh, get into some of the details to give you a sense of where I'm going. Uh, the main, my main findings about the politics is that both of those uh, different portrayals of the political processes that led to the high death rates are different from what is reflected in these materials. Um, the factional conflict is highly relevant. Um, but its nature is quite different from the way it's been portrayed as a kind of class struggle. It was not a struggle or a conflict between the privileged and powerful versus insurgents, but there was a split in civilian power structures from the top of the province all the way down into the counties and districts of rural areas. The Allied Command faction was closely aligned with military district forces, uh, and with County People's Armed Departments, Ren Wu Bu, and Village People's Militia. Uh, the massacres were carried out by ordinary villagers, but they were members of the village militia and they were under orders of the provincial military hierarchy. That's, that's been very, very clear uh, in these materials. So yes, they were from the same communities, but they were tied to a military system and aligned with the Allied Command Faction. Okay. So much for the sociology. Uh, my main findings about Guangxi's distinctiveness um, is that local death rates were not at all affected by, by the presence of non-Han minorities or Hakka. Now, what I'm not saying is that the violence was unconnected with ethnic antagonism. That may well have been the case. What I'm saying is that death rates were not higher in ethnically mixed regions than in non-mixed regions. Okay, regions that were ethnically uniform had generally the same uh, net um, uh, death rates uh, as places that were mixed and places that had uh, a large Hakka population. Um, secondly, remoteness, political or geographic remoteness did not intensify the violence, but in fact insulated the remote regions from the worst violence. So it's kind of the reverse of the argument that the populations got out of control. Uh, and it suggests also that the village militia were had to be pushed 
uh, very hard to, to, to kill large numbers of people. And they did so less, uh, less willingly and less thoroughly in the remote regions. Um, thirdly, the most important feature, and this is something that no one's talked about before and should have, should have been noticed by all the analysts, the most important feature of Guangxi during this period is geopolitical. The Vietnam War was on Guangxi's border, and this was precisely during the height of the United States military escalation. We started bombing close to the border of Guangxi and violating Chinese airspace during this period of time, and that greatly alarmed Beijing and made them uh, pay a lot of attention to what was happening in Guangxi. Uh, and they intervened deeply, uh, and the interventions by different actors from Beijing um, shaped Beijing's inter uh, shaped the, the events in Guangxi in a way that created the factional divisions and perpetuated them and made them more difficult to resolve. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about that, but I can't really get too deeply into the the narrative history uh, in, a, in a short talk like this, just to remind you that Guangxi was on the front lines of the Vietnam War. Again, 1968 was the height of the Cultural Revolution. It was also the height of, uh, of the, Viet the war in Vietnam, uh, at least the war that the Americans were involved in. Uh, this, um, this is the Gulf of Tonkin. Those of you who remember the justification for the American escalation was an attack, a presumed attack on American uh, a naval vessel uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, Beihai uh, is just down the coast from Haiphong. Um, uh, Hanoi is only 200 miles from Naming, which is the capital of Guangxi. Pingxiang is the border town where the railway went through and where most of the uh, most of the military personnel and military equipment was being shipped down. Uh, from China. A lot of it was from the Soviet Union, but most of it was from China. There was a railway line that ran through Nanning, through Liuzhou, through Guilin, uh, and into Hunan. And this railway line was repeatedly blocked by factional fighting in the railways. Uh, and this was something that greatly, greatly concerned, uh, greatly concerned Zhou Enlai in particular, who tried uh, futilely for most of the year to get the different factions to stop fighting. Uh, Beijing was highly attentive to the U.S. escalation. Uh, they'd already moved uh, PLA combat and Air Force units into Guangxi, and many of these units became involved in the fighting. Uh, there, were, uh, uh, there were constant pleas to the rebel factions once they formed in 1967 to reconcile one another. Uh, and in these pleas, uh, figures like Zhou Enlai constantly emphasized Guangxi's position at the front lines of the anti-imperialist struggle against the United States. Uh, rebel leaders called to Beijing for negotiations throughout 1967. They spent, the leaders of both these factions spent most of 1967 in Beijing getting lectured and, and, and uh, harangued to stop fighting and order their followers in the province to stop fighting one another. I think no one seemed to realize that the leaders of these factions really had no command structure and couldn't get their followers on the ground to, uh, to agree to any agreements that were reached in Beijing. Uh, the Vietnam War was a key talking point in these efforts to convince them uh, to to relent. And one of the interesting things about these materials is they have great detail uh, about what was said in these meetings by various actors. Uh, the final suppression orders that were given out in July 3rd, 1968, emphasized the importance of support for Vietnam uh, as a reason for finally crushing all remaining uh, armed resistance in Guangxi. So the political narrative, I'll go through this, um, in a greatly abridged form, just so you understand the way that this, this, um, this struggle unfolded. Uh, in late 1966, uh, Wei Guoqing, who, was, who had been the head of Guangxi province uh, uh, for a decade, um, uh, was a target of all rebel factions. All rebel factions were trying to overthrow uh, Wei Guoqing. And in fact, this was the case in virtually every province in China during this period. Every single provincial leader, except one, and I, you can ask me later which one that was, he was in Heilin Zhang. Uh, every single one was overthrown. Um, on January 23rd, rebels seized power 
in Nanning. Uh, the, it was, uh, power was seized by a coalition of government staff workers, uh, industrial workers, and students. The smallest group of them were the students, by far. Uh, the provincial government and Guangxi's leaders were overthrown. Wei Wuqing was overthrown. Most of the top leaders uh, in the, the, the standing committee and the, sent, and the committee, the uh, party committee of Guangxi stood aside. They were no longer in their position. This led to uh, administrative chaos for obvious reasons. Rebel groups uh, who had seized power began to um, um, fight with one another. Uh, they split apart. They started to fight in the streets. Um, and Guangxi, like almost all the other provincial units in China during this period, were instead placed under military control after this power seizure failed. Uh, and the armed forces were to substitute for the collapsed civilian government. And the big surprise of this was that Wei Wuqing was basically rescued by Beijing and appointed to head the PLA military district forces. He was the only provincial leader in all of China to survive, except the one uh, in Heilongjiang that I'll, I'll, I'm willing to talk about later. Um, now, um, why retain Wei Guoqing? Well, it turns out, and here's, again, the importance of Vietnam. Wei Guoqing, as it turns out, was the head of the military support group to Vietnam from China in the early 1950s. He spent five years with the leaders of, of what became North Vietnam. Uh, he devised the strategy, apparently, that defeated the French at Dien Binh Phu in 1954 and forced them to withdraw and enter into negotiations. He was Guangxi's top official from 1955 on. He was placed in Guangxi because of his special relationship with what became North Vietnam. Uh, China was urging Vietnam to fight on to victory uh, and not to negotiate as the USSR was urging it to do during this period of time. Uh, and Guangxi was the staging area for the shipment of arms and personnel to Vietnam. And after Mao, uh, actually, given his record uh, in, in the war against the, Fr the French in Vietnam, uh, Wei Guoqing was arguably the only other Chinese hero of the anti-imperialist wars. Okay, so he had, he had a very special, we, we never heard of him, <laughs> Maybe very few of us heard of him, but he was, he was very important politically. And remember that one of the main, one of the two main reasons for the uh, cultural revolutions um, uh, and Mao's dismissal of Soviet revisionism was it was that it was not sufficiently uh, aggressive in confronting imperialism around the world, uh, and so supporting Vietnam was a key. It was not the it was not the most important domestic issue during the Cultural Revolution, but it was one of the two key planks of Mao's thinking during the Cultural Revolution about fighting against revisionism. Now. Um, it's important to understand how the April 22nd faction formed. The April 22nd faction basically was formed uh, out of the one wing of the rebel movement that was not persuaded, that could not be persuaded to support Wei Guoqing. Lo local rebels, almost all of them initially objected to the appointment of Guangxi's top leader um, after he was overthrown. Um, and so did the radical young members of the Central Cultural Revolution uh, group in Beijing. This would be Chi Ban Yu, Wang Li, Guan Feng, people who were uh, in their 30s and who were very active in fomenting rebellion in Beijing and Shanghai and other places. They opposed Wei Guoqing's appointment. They coordinated behind the scenes to form an opposition group out of anti-Wei Guoqing officials and rebels. Their objective was to foment a number of local, uh, so much local opposition to Wei Guoqing to convince Mao to change his mind about Wei Guoqing. Uh, unfortunately for them, they could never get him to change uh, his mind. He supported Wei Guoqing to the end. Uh, but this opposition group became the April 22nd faction, and it ended up being headed by a fellow named Wu Jinan. This is an older, uh, colder picture of him from his guerrilla war days. He was a veteran PLA commander, a Guangdong native, uh, given his birthplace, I'm fairly certain that he was Hakka also. Uh, he's a member of the Guangxi Party Secretariat from 1956 on. He was the second ranking political pro provincial party secretary in 1967. 
He was convinced by these younger figures uh, in Beijing uh, to form an opposition group of top officials. He was convinced that he would have the backing if he if he opposed Wei Guoqin. Uh, and they linked up, they linked him up with rebel groups opposed to Wei Guoqin throughout Guangxi. So that's how the two factions formed. It really was a creature of, of manipulations by figures in Beijing, close to Mao, but not quite uh, sure about the direction Mao wanted to go. So the second phase uh, is that after the formation of the two factions, their leaders were called to Beijing for negotiations in, at the beginning of May. And these negotiations lasted until early, uh, until November. Uh, and during these negotiations, the allied April faction split, spread throughout the province. Zhou Enlai met them repeatedly with faction leaders. He pleads with them to stop blocking railway lines to Vietnam and to accept Wei Guoqing as part of China's solidarity with, with Vietnam in, in the war. Uh, and the two factions spread to every city and county by August of 67, and this meant that factional conflict was relevant in every corner of, of Guangxi, every single county. Um, this is just a tabulation. Uh, it's fairly easy with 86 units of observation simply to read the narratives uh, and uh, look at the first time that a power seizure of a local a government takes place, uh, and by February or March, about 67% of every county and city in Guangxi um, had overthrown its civilian government. Uh, this line here, the dashed line, is the first time the military intervenes. Uh, and this line here is the first time that military units uh, had formed a provisional um, uh, organization to run the local government uh, and the economy. And you can see that Basically, by March of 67, the military was uh, in charge of running civilian governments all over Guangxi. Now, one of the things that created factions is very clear uh, when you read the narrative accounts that uh, the factions formed simply, uh, simply uh, over which local rebels were supported by the military when they moved in and which ones were not supported by the military. Um, and this, uh, th despite the fact that um, by March, uh, military units had intervened in most of, almost all of the counties and cities uh, in Guangxi, this solid line is the first time that you see uh, formally organized large factions that had different points of view about what the military were doing locally. And you can see that this increases to the point where all 86 by September of 1967, every single city and county has two factions. Um, this dashed line is when they uh, when their their factional divisions are expressed as support for Wei Wuqing or Wu Jinan, uh, and this these lines are when the, these local factions, which had initially had different names, adopt the name of the Allied Command or the April 22nd faction, and thereby form a network throughout the province of these two factions. So the, the factional conflict had an organizational structure. Uh, and in particular, the, um, the uh, allied command of fa uh, factions organizational structure ran down through the military district. And this also meant that the allied command uh, faction had control over village militia. And we'll talk about that uh, later. So the question is, who carried out the, one of the most important things about the politics of this is, well, who carried out power seizures? Uh, if, if, uh, if the local military is making a choice over who, who they should support and who, sh who they should not support as part of these new uh, provisional governments that they're forming, uh, it's important to realize that, that there are uh, actually very few workers uh, very few salaried workers and even fewer students uh, in counties, in the rural counties, 80, 80 of these. So if you look at large prefectural uh, level cities, there aren't even, there aren't that many um, college students in Guangxi at all. There are more college students uh, in at Tsinghua University than there are in the, the entire province of Guangxi at that point in time. Uh, the most important thing here is that uh, high school students, very few high school students on the average uh, in counties, very few salaried workers, but note that the percentage of administrative cadres in the government, the ratio of that number of people 
to the total number of people in salaries, under salaries and not working in agriculture in the counties is very high. And it turns out that that's the group that carried out power seizures. It was actually the cadres who worked in the county and district governments. Okay, our, our image of power seizures is based on the large cities and particularly Shanghai, where you have large workers' movements aligning themselves with large uh, university student and high school student uh, red guard movements. That's not the way. That's not the way civilian governments collapsed in Rongxi. So if you simply code the descriptions um, of 92 government level jurisdictions, I, I also include the prefectural governments, um, which overlap with the counties. Uh, there's several different types of, of power seizures. One is a broad alliance where you get um, the kind that occurred in the capital of Nanning, where you have, um, you have uh, students, student radicals, you have worker, uh, worker rebels, and you have rebel cadres from inside the government. Uh, only 11 of these jurisdictions had this kind of broad alliance that looks a little bit like the Shang, famous Shanghai power seizure. Uh, in 16 of these power seizures, uh, cadres uh, in the county government or in the city government decide to carry out a power seizure and they invite some Red Guard leaders or worker rebels to join them. Uh, in 43 of these power seizures, the cadres just seize power and they ignore everyone else. Okay. Uh, and so these are places where uh, there, are, there are power seizures by some kind of rebel group. Uh, there are about 14 uh, localities where the cadres seize power over their own offices, but don't don't get the chance to try to seize power over the government as a whole before the army moves in. Uh, and there are about nine places where there there's simply no power seizures at all. So to the extent that that the civilian governments throughout Guangxi were overthrown, it was it was radical uh, staff uh, and uh, and office staff and ordinary cadres in the government. If you think about it, that's the group in China that has the biggest stake in this kind of political movement because their jobs are on the line. And if you lose your jobs and you're denounced, if you go, if you if you permit the your your boss to be overthrown and you haven't you haven't organized against him, you will go down with him as one of his supporters. And so uh, this, I, I don't really uh, emphasize this in this book, but in a previous book, you can show that, that there was a, a kind of a escalating process of rural, not just rural, but um, uh, ordinary cadres that overthrow their own superiors in a wave-like movement across China in early 67. So why did local factions form? Well, they formed out of rival cadre rebel groups. So, you know, the idea that one faction were privileged and the other faction were, were insurgents that were not privileged uh, didn't make any sense if you read this, that this is a split between two groups of people that actually were in the most privileged positions at each level. The, the People's Armed Department and uh, at the county level and the PLA commanders had to adjudicate these disputes over different cadre rebels. Uh, and the rebels they supported pledged to Wei Guoqing and the Allied Command. And the rebels who were denied support tried to get outside support by pledging to Wu Jinan, and they became associated with April 22nd. And that's the way this, this uh, factional struggle spread out through the military networks and the government networks all the way across Guangxi. Um, and the Allied Command uh, had overwhelming military support, superiority in the rural regions because they controlled the, the militia and the villages. So the third, third phase of the, these key developments, uh, and the story itself is actually pretty interesting. I think mean, it's more interesting than, than the statistical analysis that I'm going to offer you a little in a minute. Uh, but during this May, November to November 1967 negotiations, the April faction appeared to have the upper hand. Uh, and in August, their success appeared imminent. And they were being told by their supporters, uh, these young radicals in Beijing, that, they're, that they, were, they were asked, well, what's your demand? Because we, <laughs> it looks like Mao is going to come down on your side. Uh, and then there's another surprise. 
Uh, in early September, Mao uh, basically gets uh, sickened by, uh, he, 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 he's uh, tired of all the uncontrolled factional violence across China uh, and decides that uh, he needs to rely much more heavily on the military commanders and, as a, and to, to dr dramatize his shift in attitude, he purges the supporters of the April faction on the Central Cultural Revolution Group. He purges Wang Li, Guan Feng, and Xi Ban Yu and denounces them for wrecking the Cultural Revolution. So this is not a good thing for the April 22nd faction because these are the people who were supporting them all along. Um, and so Mao tells his military district commanders to form revolutionary committees as fast as possible. And revolutionary committees in most of China, except for Beijing, Shanghai, and maybe one or two other places, uh, essentially were a form of military government. Military officers dominated them. They formed these committees that had token representation of surviving officials and rebel leaders. Uh, but basically, the military was going to form a new government. Uh, we can talk about, I mean, I, I really doubt that Mao intended at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution to turn China into a military dictatorship. And I think within a few years, uh, he made moves against the military that ended up with the Lin Biao affair, but that's well beyond this. Uh, but that's where the, that's that's what he was forced to do at this point in time. So the April faction in September is out of luck. They're forced to accept a provisional committee headed by Wei Wuqing, who's going to form a new government. Uh, and it's pretty clear that if you're if you're head of a provisional committee, you're going to be head of the Revolutionary Committee, and that's what happened. Uh, and so the delegates who had been in Beijing for these negotiations for about seven months uh, were sent back to Nanning with great fanfare. And so their descriptions of them being flown on an airplane, they landed in Nanning, they're met by adoring, uh, adoring fans um, uh, <laughs> who came out to celebrate the great victory. Um, Shortly after they returned to Guangxi, the preparatory committee breaks down. Uh, the Allied Command, they break down because the Allied Command, working through the People's Armed Departments and counties, began to consolidate their control by using rural militia to suppress the April faction as class enemies. Anyone who opposed their decisions were designated as class enemies. Uh, there were local massacres uh, because the local um, April faction resisted. There were local massacres that began on a small scale in early 68. The April faction mobilized in response and they rearmed their groups. In fact, they armed for the first time and created field armies to fight back because they were, they were being exterminated. Uh, this led the local People's Armed Department to intensify violent suppression. And so the killings in Guangxi began to escalate to unusually high levels of, by March of 1968. So this is the final part of the story. Um, this is the period when the United States is uh, escalating its bombing near the border to its highest levels. Um, I think we had 600,000 troops in Vietnam at that point in time. Um, when the Cultural Revolution began, it was about 50,000. Uh, there was widespread factional warfare breaking out for the first time in Guangxi, and the province really started to descend into chaos by uh, March and April of 68. And so with the window to succeed closing, the provisional committee uh, charged that the April faction actually represents the reactionary classes and foreign powers that are seeking to overthrow Communist Party rule. Okay. Now, this is this is something that the CCP has in its DNA. This is the kind of thing they said were behind the protests in Hong Kong, for example, just a few years ago. Um, and so the local authorities in Guangxi began to submit false reports to Beijing about an underground nationalist anti-communist Salvation Army with ties to, to uh, Taiwan and the American imperialists and so forth. And they said, we know where the headquarters is. And they gave an address in Nanning, which was the headquarters of the April faction. Um, the reality was that the Provisional Committee was failing in its mission to settle factional splits equitably and to form local revolutionary committees. That was the reality. And so um, we'll move to some, some statistics now, move away from the, you know, the narratives. But if you look at um, the cumulative death rates, I won't get into how I estimated these, but the ultimate death rate in Guangxi was 4.0. And so if you, if you uh, basically count the percentage of deaths that are reported each month, 
you can estimate the point at which Guangxi became more violent than other places in China. And so in, in June of 1968, they were still below the ultimate uh, national average uh, outside of Guangxi of 2.0 per thousand. That shot up in July uh, and basically reached its height in September when, these, uh, when the Revolutionary Committee was formed at the end of August, the violence stopped suddenly, okay? So the core question, uh, this is the this is the story, very, very simplified story that emerges from the narrative accounts. Um, there, there, there are some things I left out of this that are really quite remarkable. Wei Wuqing was attacked twice in Beijing by representatives of the April 22nd faction. The second time he was captured at his hotel in the Jinxi Bingguan. Uh, he basically ended up in the hospital for about a month. Uh, they broke his leg. He was bleeding from... Uh, <laughs> He had a concussion and so forth. Um, there are dramatic descriptions of Zhou Enlai pleading and arguing with the, the factions in these meetings. Uh, and in fact, if there's a hero in this book, and this this is something I, I run into again and again, Zhou Enlai is the only the only leader who behaves responsibly uh, during this period. But we can we can talk about my affection for Zhou Enlai some other time. We still haven't addressed the question of who carried out the rural killings and who were the groups killed. We still haven't gotten to the core of the question. Uh, that we're basically talking about you know, what was the nature of the political conflict? Were the rural districts really isolated from urban factional conflicts, as, as Suyong um, argued? Um, did community level hatred spin out of control? Did local ethnic composition affect death rates? Uh, was the violence more severe in remote counties that were beyond the control of authorities? I've already told you where I'm going, but now let me just show you the evidence that's behind that. Uh, and again, this comes from coding events uh, uh, for each of the counties and cities, uh, day by day, week by week, month by month. Uh, and, and just laying out the pattern uh, that was uh, included in these materials. And I should say that that uh, with 18 volumes of material, the, the authorities never did anything with this material. I mean, they, they wrote like a 40-page, a I guess, executive summary of what their conclusions were, but they never analyzed any of the data uh, in there. And if they had, they could have analyzed a number of questions that never been considered. And that's so basically they left this as a legacy for future researchers. So the first question is, was there factional conflict in rural districts? And the answer was yes, there was quite a bit of it. It was um, it, this uh, basically, what is this? It's 1,200 events with, that are recorded within counties where they name, uh, where they describe factional conflict of some kind. These are the number of actions. This is the percentage. So uh, 58% versus 42% of the actions, uh, this is urban, this is rural. Uh, number of deaths, there are a greater percentage of deaths were reported, uh, I'm sorry, deaths from factional conflicts were reported uh, in rural areas than uh, urban areas. If you look at the identity of those killed, the red bar is people who were uh, identified as members of the April faction, okay? Uh, this is overall for Guangxi as a whole. You can see for cities, there are only six cities. It's not a very urbanized place. Almost everyone who was killed in the cities were April 22nd faction members. Uh, I've not included any descriptions of the uh, urban combat in, in Guilin or in, in Nanning here, but there's a great deal of description of them in the books. And in the book, and it looks like it looks like urban warfare. Um, whole districts were leveled in the fighting at the end. <clears throat> this is in counties. Counties are more rural, obviously, than the cities. Uh, and again, the majority of the people who are identified as killed uh, are from the April faction. Uh, these are unidentified masses. These are members of the bad class households that, that Su Yang, uh, Yang Su emphasized in his writings. And these are others. And if you look, if you just take these people, this group here and look at the breakdown within counties uh, between the county seat and the um, uh, what we now call township townships. These were the urban settlements uh, in, in the counties. You can see, again, the vast majority in the urban uh, regions of these rural counties. Um, vast majority of those killed were um, April 22nd faction members. 
But when you get into the villages, uh, it's it's a more even distribution. And in fact, the people from these bad, so-called bad classes uh, outnumber finally the April 22nd faction uh, in, in the villages. Well, who carried out the killings? If you look at the descriptions in these materials, uh, they there are 2,492 mentions uh, involved in 31,000 deaths in these descriptions. Uh, and uh, these are the percentage of the total who are said to be responsible for the killings. Rural leaders, uh, militia or security people, uh, uh, members of, of the, under the command of a revolutionary committee that's just been formed, uh, and the allied faction. These add up to about 90%. 90% of the people who carried out the killings are associated with the Allied Command, rural militia, rural leaders, or recently formed revolutionary committees. Okay, so um, Su Yang, Yang Su was correct that very few people were killed by factional warfare, um, um, but he thought all of these deaths were being uh, carried out by ordinary people who were activated by this false story about class enemies trying to make a comeback, when in fact it was the organized militia that were carrying these things out. Now, that's those are descriptive statistics, but um, if you try to do something a little bit more uh, rigorous, um, you, you don't have a lot of points of observation, but still you can get a pretty clear pattern. There's wide variation of death rates across counties and cities. Um, there's wide variation in the presence of minority populations in Hakka. Uh, and the question is, did the reach of the state affect death rates? Were killings worse where the party state control was weak? So this is uh, a map of, of uh, Guangxi with county level units, a variation in local death rates. The darker the color, the higher the death rates. You can see there's plenty of variation there, uh, which means that actually uh, only, only part of Guangxi was Guangxi-like, right there. Uh, this table uh, sorts out the 80 counties uh, into four quartiles, uh, 20 counties each. Uh, and if you look at the percent of the total deaths in Guangxi that are uh, in the counties that are generated, more than three quarters are uh, generated in half the counties. Uh, these counties have death rates, uh, average death rates that are uh, no worse than the rest of China. Uh, and these other counties, the other half, have very high death rates that are multiples of the rest of China. So um, where are the minority populations? It turns out that, that they're mostly in the western part of, of, uh, of Guangxi, and this reflects the historical migration patterns where Chinese-speaking migrants from the north pushed the Zhuang and the Yao uh, out of where they were living and moved to the west. It turns out that actually there aren't many Hakka in, in Guangxi. Um, uh, Yang Su's book considered both Guangdu and Guangxi. Um, only about 12% of Guangxi's population are Hakka, about uh, more than one third of Guangdong's population were Hakka. So I, I, still, I still look closely uh, to see whether death rates in these Hakka regions were higher than elsewhere. Uh, but even if they were, it's hard to argue that the Hakka would have had a big impact on the overall death rates. Um, uh, one of the arguments um, in, in the book is that the violence escalated over time, and, if you, and it was part of the effort to recreate new governments, new revolutionary committees. So in the counties where the uh, Revolutionary Committee was formed in March 1968, there were 46 of them, the average death rate is 2.9, which is about, per thousand, which is about 50% higher than the rest of China. Uh, if they were formed in April 68, there were 31 of these counties, uh, and it's almost double the death rate for the rest of China. The final nine were very, very violent. Uh, and what this basically indicates is that it was part of the authorities forming or reforming uh, or reasserting government control through the military uh, that led to the greatest levels of violence. So what should we observe in the data when we look at, at these uh, variation across these counties? 
Um, if, if we're seeing intergroup co conflict, uh, that means massacres are spinning out of control as ordinary people begin killing their neighbors. Uh, you should see that death rates should be higher in geographically or politically remote regions around the provincial borders, places that had fewer cadres per capita, where the reach of the state was weaker, where presumably the village militia were not as disciplined or as numerous as in other places. If it was a counterinsurgency campaign, which, I'm, which I'm, I think these materials suggest, the, the, the narrative descriptions suggest this, the death rates should not be higher in remote regions. They should be the same or lower than other regions. Uh, and if it was a counterinsurgency campaign, uh, death rates should be higher where revolutionary committees were established later. So uh, I'll just summarize the material. I won't show you uh, a, a, a table with regression coefficients and so forth. That's really not <laughs> uh, not quite visible on Zoom in any case. Um, but there's no net impact on local death rates uh, by any any way of looking at the minority population, any way that you specify the variable. Uh, it just doesn't matter. Um, Hakka population has no impact. Distance from the provincial, the prefectural capital, no impact. Uh, the number of local party members um, for every thousand local party members for population, no impact. Uh, and this is basically the summary of the entire statistical um, statistical um, test of these arguments. Um, population, obviously, the the more for every 100k population. Death rates increase by uh, uh, 20 percent. Uh, urban areas slightly less. Uh, this is uh, number of cadres per thousand uh, population. I'm sorry, every, I'm, this is wrong. For every thousand cadres uh, additional that you have in a locality controlling for the total population, there's a 27 percent increase uh, in the death rate. Counties that are located on the borders have death rates that are the net death rates that are 48% lower than other places that aren't on the, uh, on the margins of the province. Uh, and for every month, every month's delay after January 68 that the Revolutionary Committee is formed, there is a 17% cumulative increase in the death rate. Okay. So, uh, why Guangxi? Uh, this is the overall conclusion. The Guangxi massacres were not genocidal intergroup violence like Rwanda, like Partition Era India, or like Bosnia Herzegovina in the 1990s. This is not like ethnic cleansing. Uh, uh, the killings of the bad classes pushed the death rates above the rest of China, but they were only around half the total. And the, the, the members of these bad classes were selected by the militia for killing, primarily in regions where there were no April 22nd faction numbers. But the militia had to do something, and their authorities in um, the authorities in Nanning were arguing that um, there was a, a province-wide uh, conspiracy by former class enemies headed by the April 22nd faction. If they couldn't find active April 22nd members there, it stood to reason that the, the, former, the form, former members of the landlord class uh, and so forth, who were the class enemies of the regime, were, uh, it was open season on them. Uh, and we can describe, I'll, I, I'll, I'll give you more detail on the question and answer period if you want. Uh, the killings were uh, directed by the County People's Armed Department. This is very clear um, in these descriptions uh, and the statistical evidence tends to support that. They were carried out by members of the militia. They were not, but they were ordinary men, young men, uh, but uh, it was the militia and not the population that spun out of control. Uh, Guangxi, it turns out, was a counterinsurgency campaign that looks very much like the massacres in Indonesia of communists and leftists in 1967 and 1966. So the systematic extermination of political opponents organized by the military in Indonesia after a, a coup attempt that apparently led to the death of several 
generals. And so there was an organized campaign in Indonesia uh, to root out communists and leftists. And the big difference between Guangxi uh, and, and Indonesia is that there were real uh, longstanding and organized political divisions uh, in Indonesia. Indonesia had the largest communist party in the world uh, outside of China uh, at that point in time. Uh, what's most tragic about Guangxi is that these this conspiracy, alleged conspiracy of the, against the um, Chinese communist regime uh, was entirely um, fake. Uh, it was it was based on an, on a, an assertion, uh, a kind of conspiracy theory that the authorities were uh, using to cover their attempts to crush the remaining April 22nd rebellion. Um, and in fact, the cleavages that were um, the cleavages that were exterminated with such great violence uh, at the end of 1960, August 1968 in Guangxi were actually created by the Cultural Revolution itself, which is probably the most tragic thing about this. So that's that's basically a, a, a summary of, of the book, and we have um, a, close to half an hour uh, for questions and answers. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. This was uh, really fascinating and an extremely interesting and detailed account. Uh, and, and amazing that that actually was all in the books and wasn't touched until you had a closer yeah. look. Uh, I also find the analogy with Indonesia uh, very interesting, and I might have a few uh, remarks on that later mm -hmm. on. But uh, let's go to the questions. If you have, I mean, feel free to put on your a camera, everybody. That it's great to see faces rather than black box. But uh, if you have a question, uh, do like uh, Chi Dong Tao has done, uh, raise the yellow hand, and I'll give you the word. Uh, Dong Tao, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, congratulations, uh, Professor Water, for another wonderful book uh, about uh, cultural revolution. I have two questions. The first is about uh, the role of Zhou Enlai. Uh, as you said, he was the hero. Uh, but it seems in this case, it did not have the final authority over these two faction leaders. Yeah. I, I think it's quite uh, puzzling to me because everyone respected him. And uh, uh, so can you explain a little bit more about uh, uh, the role of Zhong Enlai in this case, uh, yeah. this first one? The second is, uh, I'm not sure my understanding of your um, uh, arguments about the counter insurgency campaign. Is that just a name? Uh, because uh, essentially there's no insurgency uh, in this case, right? It's just a name. It's a, it's a, it's essentially it's a still the factional uh, conflict in the name of the anti uh, counter insurgency, right? If that's the case. So yeah. what's the difference between your argument of the, yeah. about the factional conflict uh, uh, between your, your argument and uh, uh, the previous uh, a scholar's argument about the yeah. uh, faction conflict uh, in this case? Thank you. Yeah, th those, are, those are two good questions. Um, I, I left out a lot of the description that, that described the, the, the insurgency aspects. Um, actually, Nanning and Guilin basically um, were not quite under the control of the, well, Guilin was under the control of the April faction and Nanning was hotly contested until the very end. Uh, there was also a lot of urban fighting in Liuzhou. So the cities were out of control uh, and there was urban warfare that looked a lot like, you know, if you looked at it, it looked like Lebanon in the 1970s and 80s. Um, there were um, there were strong insurgencies in a selected number of counties by the uh, April 22nd faction. There was one county that I described in great detail called Fengshan County, where um, it, it was a fascinating case where the April faction was headed by uh, former Red, Arm Red Army veterans um, who had been victimized for trying to save there uh, they were uh, they were red army veterans but they were rural officials uh, 
who had gotten into trouble during the, the, the Great Leap Forward for trying to limit the extent of the famine by arguing that there was no more grain to be pumped out of the villages. Uh, and they led the April 22nd faction insurgency. They were in Fengshan and they drove the Allied command out of the county and he dro they drove out the People's Armed Department. Uh, and so in order to suppress this effective regional um, insurgency against the uh, military district, the military district mobilized uh, People's Armed Department militia from several surrounding counties, counties and a few PLA units uh, and, and pushed them into the hills and then pursued them as if they were uh, guerrillas who were just so so there's very there's very little in this oral presentation that describes the the civil war aspects of it but it was definitely uh, a very hard uh, as as 1968 went on uh, the April 22nd faction's armed resistance became more difficult to resolve except with overwhelming military force which is what they did in the end. And what happened in the um, uh, in the villages uh, was kind of a side effect of this push. This was happening at the same time that they were exterminating the final armed resistance by the April faction in the cities and several counties. Uh, but they also had these massacres of unarmed, unaffiliated people from uh, these historical bad class background people. Okay, categories. So that's um, all I can say is read the book, and I think <laughs> it will look like more of a counterinsurgency campaign than I than I described it here. Joe and Lai, every time <clears throat> this, uh, I first noticed, I first developed this notion about Joe and Lai in my first book on the Cultural Revolution, which was about the Beijing Red Guards. I mean, he he ran around trying to limit the damage to the greatest extent possible throughout this period. Uh, he never would, in the end, he would never violate what Mao wanted to do. Uh, and I think, you know, he. Re I think he recognized that the moment that he actually came out and opposed what Mao wanted to do, he was done. He, he would be gone. He would be down in Jiangxi uh, working on a lathe with Deng Xiaoping or maybe even be in prison like uh, Liu Xiaoqi and dying, uh, uh, being being uh, refused medical care. Uh, so, you know, but I see him running around. I don't know if he ever slept. Uh, he's constantly, he's doing the work of keeping the country together and eliminating the damage of this this leader who's, God knows what Mao is really, really after. Um, and he kind of reminds me of some of the people that served Donald Trump in his administration. Um, but so... Believe me, their parallels are are you know working through all this during the Trump administration. I'm thinking, boy, that that looks familiar. Um, but I so I see Joe and Lai as kind of a tragic hero of of this period. I mean, look, he's a he's a communist to the very core, but he's very pragmatic and he just wants to preserve the People's Republic of China uh, and somehow get through get through Mao's fit of whatever this is that he's he's trying to do and um anyway so that's that's um um that that's why i mentioned joe and lie and he he does uh he makes a couple of uh uh pleas with the faction leaders in beijing where he he actually predicts what eventually happened he told them that if you know if, if this is the way you're going to carry things out uh you're going to end up uh killing a lot of people for um you know, for no no reason whatsoever. And he warns them not to do it, and they do it anyway. So you're right. He doesn't he doesn't have power. He 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 can only limit the damage. He's he's like going behind Mao and trying to straighten up the room a bit. That's the best he can do. All right, Dr. Zoni Top, please put on your camera if you can. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. My camera uh doesn't work. So yeah. Uh, Good to see you, uh, Andy. Uh, thank you. Alito. Good to not see you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, my camera didn't work. Yeah, thank you for, for your fantastic book talk. So, yeah, I learned a lot uh, uh, from your very careful analysis. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is um, one of your uh, slides shows that the timing of the uh, formation of revolutionary uh, committee 
uh, is yeah. associated with a local uh, desktop. Yeah, I may have yeah. missed, missed your explanation. So yeah, so I, I suppose most of the kidneys uh, happened after the formation of the uh, revolutionary committee. So yeah, could you say a few more words uh, about that? Uh, yeah. My, yeah, my second question, I'm not sure if it's relevant or not. Yeah, the great uh, leap forward uh, is another big event uh, with a disastrous uh, effect. The millions of uh, Chinese died, you know, uh, in the Great uh, Famine. So scholars yeah. are also trying to explain why some localities, some provinces, uh, had more deaths uh, this than other provinces. Uh, for example, <laughs> Victor Shi and uh, his co-authors, yeah, published a paper last year. Uh, their <laughs> argument is that uh, if local cadres had a larger representation in the provincial leadership, uh, then provincial leaders. They are more or more concerned about local interests, so they tended to implement uh, less radical uh, policies, and uh, as a result, the mortality <laughs> rate was lower. So, do you think uh, this explanation can be applied to the uh, to the Cultural Revolution? So, your your Guangxi story uh, seems yeah. to be more complicated than that. Yes, yeah, so I yeah. What's your take on this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um... Uh, Yang Su thought that might be the case. Um, he had he had a, a variable in his data set for Guangdong and Guangxi, um, where where um, he looked at counties where there was someone from the north and left over uh, in the um, in the party committee of a, of a county, and he he uh, and he um, posited that that would be a kind of a north, northerner, southerner kind of factional uh, division. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't pursue that. I did in some of the narrative accounts. Um, I did see evidence that um, the people who had come down from the north, uh, many of them didn't speak the local dialect and certainly didn't speak Zhuang. Um, tended to be more radical uh, during the Great Leap Forward. Uh, in enforcing the uh, shipment of grain out of starving uh, counties. In fact, uh, two of the counties where this is mentioned had death rates of 10%. 10% of their population died in the famine, and they're very detailed about this. Um, and it was usually the local local guerrillas and local, local Red uh, Army veterans who tried to protect their people in their villages under, under their care. Um, I, I I I don't have it. I don't have any argument uh, about that. Um, uh, Su Yang uh, he, he suggested it, but he didn't really uh, in his study. He really didn't nail that down. I don't think he didn't pursue that 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 fully. But he did he did suspect that that might be the case. Um, you asked about the timing of the one obvious uh, one obvious way to interpret the the higher death rates in the later formed revolutionary committees is that, um, well, those were the places that where the fighting was so severe, they couldn't form a revolutionary committee until late. Uh, so I had to rule that out by looking at uh, the, the death rates in the months leading up to that. And it turned out that it was actually the, the death, the high death tolls were at the time they finally formed the revolutionary committee uh, and immediately afterwards. Uh, and what was different about it was that uh, it occurred after the July 3rd orders, which permitted finally the local military to use any means necessary to totally exterminate um, any any opposition. Uh, and I think that was that was ultimately uh, what what led to that that pattern, which was which was really very pronounced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, Professor Ward. It's very interesting. Um, but I just wonder whether you want to link this book with your early books about the agents of this the title agents of disorder. So people, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. you didn't talk too much today about the the origin or formation of these April groups, mm. how they formed mm. uh, the early yeah. event uh, preceding this the cultural. Yeah. Uh, Cultural Revolution. So, yeah, from your early books, the Agents of Disorder seems to you you argue many things that are not really 
defined by social coverage or those uh, right. political opinions. Is, is that also can apply to this this case in Guangxi or you want to have, this is another outlier. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, actually, it it's exactly the same uh, as the argument in uh, Agents of Disorder. Uh, and in fact, the evidence for that argument uh, is much more abundant in these materials than it was in the previous book. Uh, I didn't I didn't dwell on it because uh, I, I, I thought it would be like uh, keep I, I didn't want to keep making the same argument um, in in these that I you know I made in in um, in the previous book. I wanted to emphasize the explanation of the violence as opposed to the formation of factions. But it parallels it parallels it perfectly, and one of the things I was able to do with this, with this, with these materials, um, because I never suspected that um, that it was um, rebel cadres that overthrew uh, overthrew their their superiors um, in, in my previous book. I only I only discovered that near the end of the research, uh, but in this project. I was able to note the first time that rebel cadres formed organizations, uh, and so uh, that 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 portrayal of the process of overthrow is much more detailed, and it perfectly parallels what was in the earlier book. I, I just chose not not to uh, not to emphasize that in the talk because I thought I'd made that argument too many times. Professor Wang Gongwu. Uh, I, I was, I, that was absolutely fascinating, Andrew. Thank you very much. It really Good to see you. <laughs> cleared the air for a lot of questions that have been suspended for a long, long time. I, I was intrigued to note that you, you didn't name any of the April 22nd group at all, except Wu Jinnan at the beginning, saying that he was right. from Guangdong and he was number two and he was a, he was a part of the coup that got rid of Wu we're watching it to begin with, but you know, you don't mention anybody else, or for that matter, what happened to Wu Jinlan? Uh, did he lead, lead the April 22nd group in any way? Did he survive at any point in this whole thing? And what does it mean to be those people who are close to Wei Guqing at the, at the top in the provincial committee at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution? What happened to the whole lot of them? Yeah, the, well, the top, um, what, what's interesting about the, um, uh, the top leadership of Guangxi is that, in a way, the, the revival of this factional struggle saved a lot of them because they'd all been overthrown. And so uh, about half of, a little more than half of the, the party committee of Guangxi sided with uh, Wei Guoqing. Uh, and the top person uh, below Wei Guoqing named... Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to remember now, Chao Xiaoguang, I think was his name. He ended up being the party secretary of Guangxi after Wei Guoqing went back to Beijing uh, in the mid, I think it was the mid 70s. Um, the, the, the group of, I mean, this, is, this is in the book, uh, not in my talk, but um, there were, um, I think it was the third, the fifth, the seventh ranking uh, official in Guangxi sided with Wu Jinnan. Wu Jinnan was number two for a period. Uh, and it, it, I couldn't quite figure out from these materials what, what it was that led some officials to choose to side with Wei Guoqing versus Wu Jinnan. Wu Jinnan basically had to be convinced to step forward as the highest ranking uh, he was he was the possible alternative uh, candidate that the young radicals in Beijing wanted to head head things up. I don't think the Beijing radicals cared who who it was. They just wanted somebody who was credible enough to to show to Mao, <laughs> saying this guy this guy is not Wei Guoqing and he can lead the province. Um, but you know the, the 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 irony is that that Wu Jinnan was also supported by the entire. I'm sorry, he was also opposed by all of the rebel factions before the overthrow, right? So so the rebels, uh, who the rebel leaders who were younger, um, some of them were workers, some of them were students, some of them um, were were uh, kind of mid-ranking propaganda officials in in the provincial government. Um, they they had they had to decide um, 
uh, which of these two leaders they would pledge allegiance to, where they had they had opposed all of them uh, and overthrown all of them in January. So, you know, this is, <laughs> there are just so many ironies um, uh, if you look closely at, at, the, at the politics of the period. What I, what I try to do when I write these books um, is that I try not to use I'm assuming that um, certainly today, a lot, very few people know these names. Um, and uh, if the, if people are not really um, deeply into Chinese politics, they may find the use of a lot of personal names to be very confusing. So I try, I try to use it as few uh, as few names as I can, and uh, just refer to the top. People and then have a have an appendix with with biographical appendix. Um, I, I, I should say that one of the interesting things about uh, I think that the um, appendix to the book, which talks about how these materials were compiled, um, is is also interesting because it was uh, uh, Li Ray and a fellow named Xi Zhongshun. Uh, were responsible for organizing uh, organizing this investigation, um, and were very determined that the um, the causes the full extent of what happened and the causes of it would be revealed. Uh, and of course, it went to Hu Yaobang, uh, and Wei Guoqing <laughs> tried very very hard to suppress them to suppress the report and wrote letters to Hu Yaobang complaining about this and that. Ultimately, uh, not, none of these people were punished uh, after, after Mao's death. Um, they had to do a self-criticism, uh, but the, poli the policy that was being carried out by Hu Yaobang, I, I think probably with the support of Deng Xiaoping, was that uh, if people would simply admit what their responsibility was, um, that they would be treated leniently because they didn't want to reopen factional divisions uh, in, in inside the party. Um, but Professor Wong, I've I've written too much on this period, and I this was by far the worst um, thing that I'd ever seen in the Cultural Revolution. And I, I I decided when I sent this off to the publisher that I'm not working on this period anymore. I just can't. I just it's just too depressing. <laughs> Done a marvelous job, Andy. <laughs> well, on, on that note, uh, actually, and I, I, I won't go into it, but there is still this depressing era in Indonesia as well that you refer to and yeah. use some analogies. What is not in Indonesia is a report uh, of Li Ray and Chi uh, Jong Chuan, as you as you say, right, right, because they've never investigated it properly, and therefore. Right. I, I may agree at, at, the, at, at the surface with, with your assessment, and I respect mm -hmm. that. But I think there's a lot of detail. My wife has made a film about it, actually. <laughs> where, ah, and ah, in yeah. investigating, you find that, yes, in part, it was political, but there was a lot of a lot of very local conflicts, a lot of very local strife that right. were thrown into were right. thrown into the into the mix and into the killing. And, and as, as a result, uh, it wasn't as clear cut as we would have liked. Now, unfortunately, Chang Gung has a question and I'm going to entertain it, but I will have to leave. So I'm handing over the chair to Chen Ji Wei. Uh, I give my thanks to Andrew Walder, but I'm sure Chen Ji Wei will give more thanks. It was fascinating, yeah. Professor Walder. Thank you so much for joining us. Ch uh, Chen Gung has a question. I will have to leave this meeting. Very sorry about this, but I have, I'm running to That's end. okay. Thank you, Bert. Good to see you again. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Wardup. Yeah, actually, uh, this question is a, a small question. It's about how this uh, kind of massive killing uh, was done. Have you done any uh, research on that? Is it a kind of military conflicts between the two factions, like a military uh, battles? They using oh. they were using weapons, or uh, is a kind of uh, fight, yeah. uh, beating and uh, yeah, beating to death, or this kind of. Uh, uh, yeah. We, we, we saw uh, in other places. In the yeah, I think what's um, Su Yang was uh, Su Yang was correct that only about fifteen percent of the deaths were from factional fighting. And if you read the descriptions of the factional fighting, um, these were not well trained forces, and they didn't have a lot of sophisticated weaponry. And frankly, 
I don't think they were that committed to give their lives for these fights. Um, so I think most of the fighting, they they kind of lobbed grenades at one another or or through um, you know well, engaged in sniper attacks. I don't I don't think it's I don't think it was really serious military warfare. Most of the killings and the reason that um, I didn't describe it a great deal. Uh, because it's been described many, many times, uh, but it's described in gruesome detail in these materials. Uh, and I felt there was no sense in uh, just recapitulating horror story after horror story, but the way it's portrayed in in um, in these materials and the way I've covered it in the book is that it was highly organized, uh, that it was organized by the People's Armed Departments, uh, that uh, they sent down quotas, for each locality, they said, send us a list of all the people who are either in the April faction or are members of these, uh, you know, these Sule Funza, Sule or Wule Funza, right? Send us the list. Uh, and then they had a meeting and they decided which one they which ones they would kill. And then they would have a, a struggle session and they would take them out and beat them to death with clubs. Uh, there, there's a there's explicit descriptions about whether they should ex execute them by firing squad. And the local uh, People's Armed Department uh, commanders said, no, don't do it that way. Have have the masses, that is the, the, the militia, uh, beat them to death with their with their hands, with knives uh, and so forth. Uh, and there was some pretty gruesome, pretty gruesome descriptions. Uh, I, I really couldn't deal with the cannibalism. I don't, I don't even know what to say about that. Uh, there wasn't that much of it, but the descriptions seemed almost casual after people were killed. So, uh, other bystanders would show up and say, hey, can I have the liver? You know, and they'd take it home and, and, and cook it. I, 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 I don't know what to say about that. But one thing I did uncover that I had not read before in any of the material was that there was widespread sexual violence. Uh, and there was a lot of description of uh, women uh, in households where the male head of household was killed. They then became victimized by the militia guys that had killed the, the, the father or the husband. Uh, and there's some pretty awful descriptions of that. Um, and some villages basically auctioned off the widows to the to the men who had killed their their husbands or their their fathers. Um, you know, I I I suppose if I was an anthropologist, I would try to go deeply into the cultural dimensions of this, but I I, I just don't do that for a living, uh, uh, and I don't know what to say. I mean, the, the sexual violence you see everywhere. You see that in India. You see it in Bosnia. Uh, whenever this kind of thing happens. Violent young men tend to do violence to women when when they get the opportunity. I I don't know uh, the cannibalism. I don't. I I just don't know what to say. But uh, the one, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll stop here because there's one uh, interesting thing that was uh, described in a number of the narrative accounts and that I put into the book. There were some local village leaders who who just didn't have the heart to kill people. Uh, and they would designate people uh, as class enemies and they would denounce them, but they would not kill them. And what the county level or, or district level people's armed department officers had to do was they had to form death squads to go down into those villages and take the prisoners out of the village back to the district or the county seat and kill them there. Um, so, you know, just like the Great Leap Forward, there, there was, there's an indication that, that local leaders of villages were not willing to kill uh, their neighbors uh, and, and tried to drag their feet and protect them. And so in, in these materials, uh, there is description of, of local, uh, uh, local leaders in villages being criticized by People's Armed Department. Uh, commanders for dragging their feet. And is, they said, if if you're too timid to do this, turn them over to us, um, which is really quite remarkable. Thank you, Prof. Ward. Uh, I wonder, is, is, there, is there any other questions or comments? Um, if no, uh, 
Thanks, Prof. Wada, for this very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, we learn a lot, and I'm looking forward to your future works on contemporary China. Then, so the <laughs> <laughs> political economy of the contemporary China. I'm sure those are quite important too for yeah. <laughs> for many of us. Yeah, I, I never intended to get this deeply into the Cultural Revolution, but I kept um, kept stumbling across new sources, and it turns out I think the sources for doing research on these topics are probably a lot richer than they are for working on politics in contemporary China right now. So uh, this was dragged along by the discovery of more and more um, rich archival uh, or, or documentary sources for the period. Um, I should say that I, I I don't think oral histories have really helped me very much in any of this work uh, because the oral histories often are are not accurate and um, they're not the memories are not that clear about what happened when and why and and individuals didn't see didn't weren't able to rise above their own personal experience and see a broader pattern and so um, I. I when I started this, I thought I could do it all through interviews, but then I realized those interviews were not going to be very helpful. Um, so yeah, it's, anyway. yeah, it's good uh, to and, also see you share your all your data. Those data you shared on your website. Yeah, I put everything on the website, and you know, so far the only people that are using the data sets are economists who want to <laughs> use them as instrumental variables. <laughs> Or, you know, I'm like, well, why don't you study the cultural revolution? No, no, that's all right. I'm, I've got a model of, you know, trust and in <laughs> measures of trust in the village uh, in the 1990s. And, and this is statistically very useful for me, but they're, they're not. So I think the only, the, so far, the only people who really um, are um, engaging with my work are historians now, younger historians who who have moved into the 50s and 60s. And, and now, you know, Jeremy Brown has written a book about uh, 1989. So I've been working on the same thing for so long, the historians have passed me, passed me by. Yeah, well, all right. So thanks again, uh, Prof. Wada, for uh, sharing yeah. your book. And uh, then we, I'm looking forward to your future uh, participation of all events and probably give another uh, book talk in the future at the uh, EAI. Okay, well, maybe I'll stop by Singapore in the winter. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look forward to seeing you in the all near right. future. Then. Yeah, take care. Th Thank th you. Uh, okay. Thanks for all the participants. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.